Hello everyone and welcome to the newest episode of the Read Right to Left podcast. I am G, joined by my always wonderful co-host Ray from Whimsical Pictures. Hi everybody. And this month we're doing a series spotlight for a, a manga that both Ray and I are pretty pretty avid fans of, I'd, I think it's fair to say. Yes. For March, we are talking about the, uh, I would, I'd call it a supernatural yashikai, right? Um, Mushishi, the story of a wandering Mushi practitioner called Ginko, helping various people he meets throughout his travels who have some some supernatural issues in their lives. It mm-hmm. is uh, completed at 10 volumes, finished in 2008, and released in its entirety by Del Rey way back in the day, and is yeah. now available in its, in its entirety from Kodansha digitally. So you can still get the series. The, the print volumes are very, very hard to fa- find. It was one of the series that was really being pushed out um, by Del Rey at the end of their life. So it yeah, can be very difficult um, to get <laughs> to get the print manga, but... The last three <laughs> volumes are, like, bound together in this weird, huge omnibus. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So it's, it's very hard to find in print, but if you are wanting to read the series, you can still do so digitally um and it is one that i know has a lot of fans both from the anime adaptation and the manga so if you haven't haven't tried moshishi yet hopefully this episode will maybe convince you to give it a shot if not Mm. um if you are already a fan as well hopefully this will will remind you of all the wonderful things that moshishi has to offer it's written by um, Yuki Midorikawa. That uh, yes, no, Urashibara. No. Yuki Urashibara. Urashibara. <laughs> Yuki Midorikawa would be the Natsume's book of friends creator. Uh, yes. Which, if you like Mushishi, you should check out Natsume's book of friends, and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Very similar vibes. Um, so, yes, <laughs> but. Uh, did we want to go, well, I gave a little bit of a summary, but did you want to speak a little to the series, Ray? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, this is an anthology series. Uh, it's a series of episodic chapters. Each one is pretty much wrapped up within itself. Um, most of them are these little fables uh, surrounding mm-hmm. the framing character of Ginko, uh, this Mushi, Mushishi, Mushi practitioner, Mushi master that, uh, G mentioned. Um, but not necessarily, he's not necessarily the main character in each of mm-hmm. these stories. In fact, there are only a handful of stories throughout the series where Ginko is the protagonist. Um, he's, mostly just a figure who shows up to help the actual protagonist of the episode who is whoever happens to be ailing from these supernatural issues and i think that the main thing to know about mushishi going in is that we're not necessarily dealing with strictly yokai or demons or ghosts or what have you Mm -hmm. there's a lot of overlap But uh, we have some very specific lore going on here uh, with (laughs) these creatures called Mushi um, that, like, Mushi means, like, a bug in Japanese, and it's actually a made-up kanji in the title that just has three of the radicals for bug. Um, Mm -hmm. But Mushi are, I guess, they're a bit hard to explain. They're, like, the most primordial form of life in existence, even simpler um, and closer to life's very roots than, like, single-celled organisms and bacteria. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and only certain people can even see them. Um, and many of the people who can see Mushi go on to become Mushishi, who are these doctors who go around helping people who have Mushi-related ailments. Um, the Mushi can really be just about anything. I guess the core image within the series is that you see them floating around and they look very microbial. Mm -hmm. Um, but, like, there's one episode that has this, like, magical rust, and that's Mushi. There's another episode with, like, a rainbow that can be caught. That's Mushi. Um, mm -hmm. There's another one where, like, this kid's grandmother gets turned into Mushi, and she's like a ghost. Um, it really can be anything. There's a lot of overlap with, like, yokai mythology and the Japanese idea of, like, kami. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, I would say a core fascination of the series is not just the human drama and the sort of beautiful depictions of the natural world, but also just, like, I don't know, learning about these weird little things. <laughs> <laughs> and n not just learning about these weird little things, but sort of the relationship that humans have. It's a somewhat symbiotic relationship because Mushi are part of the natural world and you can't get rid of them. Like they, you can't, you can't eradicate Mushi because they serve a very fundamental purpose. But like with a lot of symbiotic and parasitic relationships, it's not exactly, you know, healthy for, or going to be a <laughs> positive impact for the people affected by these Mushi or who have come across these Mushi. So it's really interesting seeing the balance between uh, the more human characters and how their reactions and relationships to these Mushis grow, change, are very, very different from each other. And that's really part of the appeal, I think, for this series, is getting some of that yeah. insight to um, humanity's relationship with the natural world. Yeah, then that's what I was going to say there is, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that really, in general, what Mushi seem to represent most of the time is just the relationship between humanity and nature, which we are a mm -hmm. part of, um, and just exploring that from all kinds of different perspectives. A lot of the stories have... Uh, not the happiest of endings, but then some mm. of them do. I would say Mushishi is fairly known for its, uh, more bitter than sweet endings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good summary. I think it's a series that really, because of its episodic nature, is very easy to revisit or to take at a very slow pace to take in little bite-sized pieces it's not one that you have to sit down and read a whole bunch of chapters because there's no real overarching plot um it is just these little snippets into other people's lives which makes it a easy recommendation to give even if you are just looking for print volumes because there's not too many chapters that have that rely on knowledge of previous chapters um similarly to as as mentioned not somebody's book of friends there's you can go into it quite easily without needing this whole huge backstory um because we don't really get this huge backstory as to what Mushi are. There's We don't get necessarily large lore dumps. We learn pretty organically over the course of the series as to what Mushi are, but to, to that same extent, no one fully knows what Mushi are. Um, so <laughs> there's not like a huge, uh, yeah, amount of, of core knowledge or plot um or there's a couple recurring human characters aside from ginkgo but 
you they're don't... pretty easy to get a hold of, I think. Just yes. <laughs> <laughs> like you okay, know what you're getting with them. collector man. <laughs> <laughs> Collector man and uh, foot lady girl who writes stories. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, even I would say it is even easier to go into than like Natsume, which has mm-hmm. sort of an ongoing story of Natsume and his friends, his growing group of yokai and human friends. Because, mm-hmm. like, there's literally like what one, two three like five episodes that center on ginkgo otherwise it's literally (laughs) just just the characters from that episode you know Mm -hmm. so it's not one that's really meant to be absorbed in one sitting i don't think uh which is it's nice It, it sort of creates this vibe of like just flipping through a book of fables or more specifically like it makes me think of like talking to a grandparent about mm-hmm. you know the ghost stories from their town um which a lot of these stories actually if you read the notes at the back of the manga volumes you know Udo Shibata sensei talks about uh where she gets the inspiration for these stories some of them come from very famous uh japanese folk tales some of them come from uh folk tales from other parts of the world uh, some of them just come from, like, old wives' tales. There's an episode I like mm-hmm. that's about how it's dangerous to whistle at night. Um, <laughs> but, like, honestly, I think most of them come from stories that she herself has heard from uh, her grandparents and other older people mm-hmm. that she's met going throughout um, very small town countryside Japan, which is something that she mm-hmm. clearly has a lot of love for. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on, like, the idea of Furusato, this, like, pastoral, idyllic hometown that everyone Mm -hmm. is always longing to go back to. Um, Mm -hmm. that sort of mythical Furusato is where Mushishi finds its bread and butter, I think. It also is the emphasis of, to your point, the oral history. Like, so many of the stories with it not just from that Oroshibara sensei took to to put into um to put into mushishi but how the knowledge of mushi and how ginkgo as a person explains a lot of thing these things and this idea of this this collector and this woman who who tell writes down all of these stories is this oral history is collecting all of these various mm-hmm. pieces of knowledge that people have figured out over the course mm-hmm. of, you know, humanity existing amongst Mushi, but mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily, like, there's not an encyclopedia you just go to to look things up. It's yeah. all little bit, bits and pieces that, you know, somebody's grandmother, this happened to them, or, you know, my friend's sister-in-law this happened to her or she saw this and there's a reason that we don't go to this forest in the middle of the night Mm -hmm. etc it's very very interesting and it gives that very it's a calm atmosphere but can be a little you know a little bit spooky a little bit um (laughs) you know it can be very scary sometimes um in a really twisted but organic way and yeah. um, I really like the mix of the calmness with that more existential <laughs> yeah. dread. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Like, I, I really like... When it gets really horrific, mm-hmm. usually it's not... With, like, a couple of very glaring exceptions. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm looking at you, Cotton Changeling. Um, uh the series is like when it gets very very horrific it that is also when it tends to get its most like moralistic um it's always like the folly of humanity these ugly Mm -hmm. human emotions that are twisting 
twisting everything. Usually, um, like these hubristic attempts on the parts of humanity to use Mushi for their own gains is when things go horribly, horribly wrong. Uh Um, because Mushi, you know, uh, they're just vibing, right? (laughs) <laughs> yeah they, they're, they're just, just hanging existing. out they're just doing their own thing <laughs> even if it ends up meaning like being a deadly parasite to humanity it's not like they're mm-hmm. trying to hurt someone <laughs> mm-hmm. um this is something that ginkgo repeats like pretty much every episode he's like uh mushi are just hanging out like mm-hmm. i don't know what to tell you they're not they don't got anything against you. They're just doing their thing, you know? <laughs> They're just living their lives. <laughs> so, like, y'all should just live your lives. <laughs> <laughs> Some people just can't leave well enough alone. Of course not. Um, <laughs> I also like, to the point of, like, this oral history being the main way that this knowledge is passed down, I really like how mm-hmm. isolated each village is from the next it uh is something that I feel like is quite specific to like pre Meiji Japan being so divided up by mountains. But um you really like you have these towns that people aren't they're ma- they're making their own living within their mm-hmm. own little area. And maybe they trade with surrounding areas a bit, but for the most part they're making their own food and they're eating it. Um mm-hmm. So it's like interesting because it's like every time Ginko knows to a new pl- goes to a new place, it's like he has all this context from all these other places he's been. But it's like he'll talk to the people there and they'll be like, "Oh yeah, you didn't know about the guy who uh, is stuck in the bamboo forest and can never come out." <laughs> or like, <laughs> are you telling me you don't know about our long-standing tradition of? drowning people in the ocean and waiting for their clone to come back up out of the water. We've been doing it for hundreds of years. <laughs> we did, we've done that forever, guys. I don't... How do you... Does, doesn't everybody do, do this? Jeez. Yeah. It's kind of... It's a fun... It's a fun vibe. I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, but when Mushishi wants to get... And it gets creepy a lot of the time. But when it wants to get creepy, it really cranks that creep factor up. Um, and yeah. obviously, we as humans, <laughs> as an audience of humans, there's an urge to sympathize with the people who are caught up in this mushy issue. But again, it, it Ginkgo and the series itself really emphasizes the fact that Mushi are kind of like mold. They don't, they're not purposefully going out to harm people. But if you coexist with some molds long enough, you can develop very horrible illnesses. A lot, like whatever it may be, you may die. Um, It's kind of that, it's not necessarily a good thing to be living in close capacity to them, but it's also not. There's like we can't get rid of mold. It's just a part of life. Mold just exists. You can try to prevent mold from being in your immediate area, but it's always going to exist in some form out there. And unfortunately, some someone will stumble upon it at some point. Um ooh, I'm just remembering some of the really <laughs> Well, I think that we'll get into uh, some of the creepier episodes as well as some of the more heartwarming ones, uh, Mm -hmm. since we do have a question about our favorite stories. I think from now, do we want to start getting into questions? Um, I think so. And also, I'd like to put out just, I mean, we're we're pretty free going with the spoilers in this podcast in general. (laughs) I think you're all used to it. But Mm -hmm. uh, I think that we're going to be discussing the series from this point. Uh, without paying much heed to whether we're spoiling the entire chapter. So, uh, <laughs> be warned if you're somebody who has just been convinced to go <laughs> buy the digital volumes of Mushishi or watch the anime uh, and don't want any of the stories spoiled for you, uh, you should click off right now. 
Yes, do it. <laughs> and then come <laughs> back once you've finished and listened to the rest of the episode. <laughs> yeah, we need to commiserate about the cotton changeling. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, hopefully, hopefully, um, getting into some questions. And as always, thank you everyone who did send in your questions. We have quite a few here. Um, but I think we should just start with um, always wonderful question contributor <laughs> stories on mm-hmm. shelves. Is first question, which is, uh, did you watch the anime and how did it compare to the manga? Uh, yeah, actually, my main, uh, I guess, preliminary preparation for this episode was uh, because my manga volumes are in my American collection, I just rewatched the anime, uh, mm-hmm. which is scattered across various streaming places. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, was. I'm trying to remember if I got into the anime first. I think I might have seen the anime first and then gone for the manga. Um, And then, of course, watched season two when it came out. um, After having read the whole manga. Uh, Yeah, it's... uh, To me, it's, like, honestly... Basically identical. (laughs) uh, (laughs) It's not meaningfully different in any major mm-hmm. way, I don't think. Um, Story-wise, especially. Yeah. So it's like, I think either way, you're getting a very gorgeous experience. I think artistically, mm-hmm. the styles are quite different. So mm-hmm. I do think it's worth like picking up the manga and seeing how Urushibara captures the same scenes uh, within her art. But I also think it's absolutely worth checking out the anime if you've only read the manga as well because Mm. um color and sound and motion and timing do so much Mm -hmm. for this series um it it's beautiful it's a beautiful anime especially Mm -hmm. the second season is just you'll just come across like a frame that's just so gorgeous you have to stop and stare for a while (laughs) Mm mm-hmm Similarly to yourself, I also started with the anime. It was one of the earlier uh, additions to my anime career. And I think like uh, (laughs) similar vibes, not necessarily similar plot, but uh, Holic, which was also very foundational. I think it really planted that seed in me of this, of really enjoying these little bit more eerie, um, bittersweet stories of the supernatural, mm-hmm. like you, right? Started with the first mm-hmm. season of anime. I, in the following years, read um, majority of, maybe all of the manga. I don't quite remember. And then once the second season was announced for two th- 2014, a long time after the first season, <laughs> um, we got a follow-up <laughs> second season and a film. Um, or extended episode, uh, and Two watched films, that I week think. to week, and was just totally enraptured. It's phenomenal. Uh, I'm basically just echoing your points, Ray. But one of the things that I do really appreciate for the anime adaptation is the use, and you said of sound, which is correct. Not, but I not music wise and the music is fantastic but sound design wise the way mm-hmm. that some of the silences can be so yeah. heavy yeah yeah <laughs> in, when when listening the the acting is fantastic and uh as as you said um the animation it's like every literally every single frame could be just in a gallery. It's so yeah. beautiful. <laughs> yeah, and some of the character animation in, like, the second mm-hmm. season especially is so, like, fluid and, like, detailed mm-hmm. and, like, captures these tiny little such true-to-life little moments of movement that's just, like, mm-hmm. so gorgeous. Um, 
Yeah, it's beautiful. And I'm glad you brought up the silences as well, because I think I, I will be bringing up a couple of episodes in particular that deal with them, because a lot of my favorite episodes are, like, the ones that take place in the, like, snowy mountain towns mm. in the dead of winter. And it's just, like, really captures, like, the way sound, all sound is just muffled mm-hmm. when you're in three feet of snow deep in the mountains yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> absolutely the other thing that um and i i adore the manga it's absolutely phenomenal um it's incredibly unique especially in the english market when it was being released I, mm-hmm. I think that people knew of Mushishi, the, the manga or the anime was fairly popular, which I would expect probably did lead to higher or so, more solid sales for the manga than it would have otherwise. I think it it's notable that it was one of the titles that Del Rey did actually complete when it was going through that bankruptcy slash closing down slash transition to... Kurancha, Mm -hmm. but there's something so having returned to Mushishi via anime in 2014, so eight years after the first season ended, it's Mm -hmm. almost a seamless, absolutely seamless transition. Mm -hmm. You would never believe that there was almost a decade between the productions of these two series. Really, yeah. the biggest difference is is the aspect ratio. Like the aspect watch, ratio. <laughs> we, <laughs> when you watch the first season, it's in 3 by 4 and the newer one is full screen, or 16 by yeah. 9 And, and also, just, like, the old one is from an era where it does get a little muddy, so mm-hmm. seeing that cleared up is nice. <laughs> yes. But all of those issues are due to its age, quote unquote, but mm-hmm. it it is it doesn't feel like you're watching something that that wasn't organized or planned on mm-hmm. within the year or the few years after. It just oh, I can't. It's yeah. it's amazing when we live in this this world where anime adaptations can change studios on the dime between seasons. We see it with some of the most popular titles around and people and fans, people complain about inconsistencies or studio style differences or whatever else. There was never, and obviously Mushishi has a much smaller fan base, but there was never an issue of a fall in quality or even a difference in quality. And when you have such a high standard to come from with that first season it's phenomenal that the team at Artland who did the second season was able to just keep it so incredibly consistent yeah yep (laughs) it it really is incredible um the director of the series uh this other uh, I think main claim to fame is that he directed uh, Flowers of Evil, mm-hmm. um, which uh, also had very strong visual direction. Uh, very unique. The man with a vision. <laughs> <laughs> the next question that Stories on Shelves asked, <laughs> and this I think will will be the meat of it, what were some yeah. of your favorite chapters or moments from this series? Alrighty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where do we start? <laughs> <laughs> do we want to talk about the the ones that gave us the most the most uh, goosebumps and heartbreak and uh, fear, or the ones well, that made us feel nice? <laughs> I guess first question I have is, do you have a number one favorite? Oh, that's so hard. The one that possibly affected me the most that I return to thinking to a lot 
Mm -hmm. uh, especially whenever I'm I'm remembering uh, Mushishi. Aside from aside from the chapters dedicated to Ginkgo and his life, mm -hmm. would be Floral Delusion. Okay, which is a little bit more of a standard like horror story but I don't know it appealed to me and the way that it captured that delusion is so well done um, and I just get goosebumps thinking about it <laughs> <laughs> what appeals to you about that one just this idea of like this generational commitment and further to that this generational trauma um, that is so deeply tied to this place to this person this family and mm -hmm. how how the, that story literally ends in flames the the mm -hmm. d mutual destruction is yeah. so I don't want to say it's completely common in the natural world, but it's not unheard of. And when we're especially talking about like a parasitic relationship, which this is absolutely, um, mm -hmm. it's not often that without Ginkgo that, that whole that whole cycle would have continued foreseeably into the future um, mm -hmm. without ever changing. And it isn't yeah. until there's this much larger impact essentially from... until the authorities are brought in <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> until until the outside world finally breaks into that that you do see this absolutely this breakdown in this in the cycle which leads to this mutual destruction and it's just i think i don't know yeah i think it's also interesting that like the only way that outsiders sort of get involved in this is that is when women are brought in from the outside to be brutalized. I think that's mm -hmm. very significant as well. Um, especially because, you know, they are being brutalized for the purpose of upholding this standard of beauty that these men mm -hmm. um, are so taken with. Um, and to give just a brief summary of the story that we're talking about... Uh, <laughs> So Ginko shows up at the beginning of the episode um, wanting to, like, he's heard that there's a particularly beautiful sakura tree in the area uh, that he wants to go see, uh, which is, you know, <laughs> he does stuff like that. He's like, oh, I heard there was something neat in this area, so I kind of wanted to check it out. Um, mm -hmm. He meets a woman on the road to the tree uh, who is like, I heard that if I go talk to the person who owns the land this tree is on, uh, that he can make medicine for me that will cure any illness. And of course, mm -hmm. Ginko is like, that, that, that does not sound great based on past experience. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound right. <laughs> um, kids, if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. <laughs> Yeah. If, it's, if something sounds too good to be true, someone's probably planning to cut your head off with an axe and glue it on someone <laughs> else's body. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, so they go to this tree, but they find that even though it is the middle of the Sakura season, the tree is completely bare. Um, but uh, Ginko finds a beautiful woman who doesn't seem to be able to talk see or hear um leaned up against the tree and he's like hmm that's interesting and he looks in a hole in the tree and sees this weird foam and he's like hmm i'll take note of that for later in the episode <laughs> <laughs> um uh they meet the master of that land uh and he's like okay lady uh you can't you should stay overnight here uh while i make the medicine for you um and she's like okay that sounds totally fine and not dangerous at all mm -hmm. um 
And Ginko's like, hey, uh, your family's been here for a few generations. You must be, uh, you must have been researching this, this tree and the foam. Um, and, uh, the guy's like, yeah, sure. Uh, you can look at my granddad's books about the tree. Just don't be poking any, don't be poking your nose where it doesn't belong. <laughs> <laughs> um... And anyway, uh, Ginko ends up again walking in on this guy about to, uh, yeah, chop off the woman's head and put the beautiful woman from in front of the tree, put her head on top of this woman's body, uh, so that the beautiful woman and the tree, uh, can be brought back to their former glory. Um, and it turns out that he his family's been doing this for hundreds and hundreds of years just to keep this woman mm. alive. He doesn't even really seem to know why he's still doing it. He just feels he has to. He feels it's... There, there's, I guess, the theme of, like, <clears throat> intergenerational trauma, but also of grief and the difficulty of letting go is something that Mushishi mm -hmm. comes back to over and over again. Um, and this, like, this particular story almost, um, reminds me of, like, the curse in Fruits Basket. I think it represents mm -hmm. something similar, where it is sort of this thing that at one point was this beautiful love story, perhaps, <laughs> but <laughs> has, Maybe. uh, been corrupted and corrupted and corrupted. And now nobody really even knows why they're still upholding this horrible ritual. But still, it's difficult to stop because he doesn't want to lose this woman he's been with his whole life. Even though she doesn't do anything. She's basically a rag doll, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's yeah. what the, the story is. Um, I also really like the last, like, not just the fire at the end, but mm -hmm. the way that the tree, like bursts into beautiful bloom more beautiful than it's mm -hmm. ever been before as it perishes um i think it like obviously it's like the catharsis of this horrible ritual finally coming to an end um but i also think it really brings to mind um this very japanese idea that you know sakura are always at the most beautiful just before they fall away mm -hmm. um so just in terms of the sort of natural poetry of an episode focused on a sakura tree, I think it was pretty. <laughs> <laughs> and also the natural, like if we, we pull the poetry from that in the natural poetry, the idea, poetry typically is the more structured type, has this form that cycles back to itself, right? So... It's that end of that cycle. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's just... There's a lot of things I really like about this particular episode. It's also um, more obviously like one of the very horror creepy ones. Um, I, I tend to like the, the creepier ones. Um, Shrine in the Sea is another one that I adore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the yeah, hand that um, caresses the night caresses as well. The night, that one. Yeah. That... I still just remember the end of that one and uh, that image of the crows yeah, descending. Yeah, the crows descending. Yeah, it's so Ooh. good. <laughs> yeah, so uh, this one, uh, The Hand That Caresses the Night, is about a um, older brother and a younger brother. Um, mm -hmm. The older brother is a hunter. Um who, like, they are never ever able to sell their meat because people complain that it looks, tastes, and smells rotten, basically. Mm -hmm. No matter how fresh it is, it always ends up being rotten. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, Ginko finds out that uh, the older brother has, you know, not been using a, uh, a musket or a bow and arrow, to 
down these animals. Uh, he's just been using this creepy eye-shaped, like, bruise in one of his hands um, to basically paralyze the animal in its tracks and kill it. Um, the way he finds out about this is that the guy actually mistakes him for an animal and almost murders him, <laughs> uh, which is also very scary. This entire episode, yes. like, direction-wise, particularly in the anime, is, like, mm -hmm. all of the, like, gnarled branches of the trees of this, like, dying forest and, like, Mm -hmm. The, like, putrid yellow skies. Like, it's so scary. <laughs> There's such a tension of unease where mm -hmm. you don't quite know what's going on until, obviously, we, we find out, along with Ginkgo. Mm -hmm. um, and it is really that... that... Uh, almost, again, a cathartic ending to... What is a very sad situation, um, but has yeah. just been so, because of this older brother's actions and because of him relying on something that is wholly unnatural, um, mm -hmm. has just become something that can't be controlled, that can't be contained, and ultimately leads to his downfall. Um, ooh... Yeah, I also actually, I think not just the idea of, like, obviously this is a tale of, like, hubris, of human mm -hmm. humanity, a human man trying to make, like, he is the master over nature, mm -hmm. um, but in the end realizing that he's just been one part of the forest all along. Mm -hmm. um, and when he, you know, becomes the the weaker one in the forest instead of the stronger one, then, you know, predators do what they do and they go after prey. <laughs> yes. Um, and it's not like the crows are trying to give him his just desserts. It's just the forest mm -hmm. doing what the forest has always done. Um, and he was the one who was trying to ignore that. Um, but also this is another episode about cycles of abuse and intergenerational mm -hmm. trauma. Uh, this curse of this strange birthmark in his hand is something that is passed down uh, through the men in his family. Uh, right now, he has it. It will be passed down to his little brother. It will be passed down to whoever the next generation is. Um, and it belonged to their father before them. And their father followed exactly the same path as the older brother in this episode, where he became very violent and frightening and abusive and the kids ultimately had to run away from him mm -hmm. um and uh i think the imagery of that is like it's so it's so creepy too because what happens to the mm -hmm. father is that like he like he becomes less and less human and as he does he also gradually loses his corporeal form until one day mm -hmm. they walk in on his 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 bedroom and on his futon is just an empty uh, pair of pajamas. Like it's just, it's, he's not there anymore, which is so creepy. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and then the curse passes to the older brother and he's like, well, you know, I'm not going to let anybody, you know, throw us around like our dad did. I'm going to use this mm -hmm. power to protect you, my little brother. Um, and which is no doubt what his father before him thought for a while, but it's like he becomes so, like, obsessed with this idea of keeping his younger brother safe, of being the strongest one in the forest so that no one else can take advantage of them, that that anger and that hatred and that desire for control twists him as well, and then his little brother has to call on Ginkgo because he's afraid of his brother now. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, that's that's so fucking sad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but that one has a happy ending. I mean, the the, mm -hmm. the older brother does get, like, pecked half to death by crows, but he's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but he's, he's fine, fine, and 
he's fine and he takes his medicine now, so. <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's a bit banged up, but he'll, be, he'll live. It's fine. He'll live. He's a bit banged up. He lost his arm, but, you know. <laughs> a bit banged up. <laughs> a bit banged up. Honestly, it's gonna be hard to Mushi, she, now, that but... really is just a yeah. bit banged up. <laughs> he's, he's doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> he's still alive. That's better than most. Yeah, he's not like some horrifying, like, plant zombie. <laughs> <laughs> There are so many of those. There's so many plant zombies. Hey, (laughs) hey, do you want to talk about the Cotton Changeling? (laughs) Yeah, we can definitely talk about the Cotton Changeling. Uh, That's the creepiest episode in the first season. There's others, but oh boy, that one is the most, like, Mm. strictly horror, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, it's about creepy plant zombie kids who take over a home. (laughs) <laughs> yep. They're more yes. like mushroom zombies, I guess. Yeah. Mold zombies. They, mm-hmm. They infect the, uh, the pregnant mother and mm-hmm. uh, once born go at an alarming rate and start to yeah. develop green spots before dying. But it's okay. There's another one on the way. Yeah, and, so, uh, um... <laughs> they, uh... <laughs> the mother in this episode is basically has a miscarriage and is like so mm-hmm. like it's not a miscarriage she gives birth to slime right mm-hmm. because her fetus and the reason is because her fetus has actually been killed and replaced by this fungus yes um, so she gives birth to the slime that like later they look under their house and find that it has formed into a little green-haired baby. Um, but her, having, you know, not at all recovered from the trauma of the miscarriage, um, is like, oh my god, it's our baby! We He's finally here! Mm. <laughs> um, and she names it Watahiko, and uh, she's like, look, husband! Look at our beautiful baby that I found! <laughs> Under the deck. (laughs) Um, Her husband's like, whatever makes you happy, dear. (laughs) But then, like, the baby starts growing at, like, a distressing rate. And um, six months later, when the baby is, like, five years old, she suddenly (laughs) gives birth to another one. (laughs) Um, and then it keeps happening every six months until she has, like, five or six of these little gremlins. Um, and they can't speak. Um, they're, like, developmentally, they are, like, whatever age they're actually supposed to be. They're, like, infants. Infant children. (laughs) Um... (laughs) But Ginko's like, okay, um, that's not your child. I'm sorry, but your child has been killed and eaten by these fungus babies. Um, in utero. They, you, in you, utero. Yeah. I'm sorry that you have to find this out again, but you did have a miscarriage. Um, and uh, so... And he's like, when... The kid starts getting green spots, that means that it's reaching, you know, each kid is just a branch of the fruiting body of this mold under your house. Um, so when it gets green spots like that, that means that it, that particular branch of the fruiting body has reached its natural lifespan. And you need to kill it before it dies, uh, or else it's going to release spores, Mm -hmm. Um, and good lord, we do not want that to happen. (laughs) (laughs) Because it will happen again, and this will keep happening. But of course, the mother, who all of this time has essentially been prevented by these fungus children from going through the proper stages of grief for her miscarriage, uh, is like, you're not going to kill my children. What are you crazy? What are you doing with that axe? Mm. <laughs> um, 
Uh, yeah. Uh, but so so Ginko is like, you know what? Uh, I'm just gonna. I've told you the treatment. I've told you what you need to do, which is kill the kids before they release spores. Uh, you know, and I feel bad just kind of axing a bunch of children right now. Uh, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna leave you guys, uh, for three months or whatever, and I'm gonna come back, and we'll, we'll see what's happening. Uh, send me a letter if anything goes wrong before then. And he gets a letter before the three months. Um, because he comes back, and it turns out that the children have developed intelligence. And not only that, but they have a hive mind. Um, (laughs) they can speak. And they are hive-minded, so anything that one of them learns, all of them know. Um, and they have gained enough awareness to realize that Ginko and the father are both trying to kill them. And they're like, we don't want to die. <laughs> so, Please, sir, don't kill us. <laughs> uh, so after a very creepy scene in which, um... One one of the dying children, the one with the green spots right now, uh, mm. propositions Ginko and is like, you know, we didn't mean to do it. Like, it's not our fault <laughs> mm-hmm. that we ate that baby. And Ginko's like, well, it's not my fault either that I have to kill you. So, so then the 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 baby telepathically is like, oh, didn't work. Do it, boys, and they set the house <laughs> on fire. <laughs> <laughs> um and anyway in the end ginko does get stabbed by the mother but they do make it out alive all of them uh and they do manage to uh ginko manages to take out the uh the mold in the under the house mm. and uh he even manages to get a souvenir <laughs> so it's all right. It all worked yeah. out in the end. It's, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> that one's scary. <laughs> mm. Uh, one of my favorite like creepier episodes, um, mm-hmm. slash chapters. Yeah, when I say episodes or chapters, it's like it really is interchangeable. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh is uh the one night bridge yeah uh-huh um so this one is a sort of romeo and juliet love story it's a uh, a boy and a girl who are from two very different classes i think um mm-hmm. and the the girl is basically her mother has found her uh, a, a suitor, suitable husband, a suitable husband uh, within like the head family of like the town or the next town over or something like that. Um, but the girl herself already has someone that she loves, which is just a boy from the village. But unfortunately for her, uh, her mother does not see her as a person, but as an object. So. <laughs> Um, her and the boy, uh, decide to run away, but she does not seem very keen on this. The boy is very like, we have to go. There's nothing for you here, but he doesn't seem very eager to ask her how she really feels about the situation either. (laughs) Um, and it's very clear that she is very torn. Uh, between mm-hmm. going with this boy who she loves or staying and, you know, not throwing away her entire family and not leaving mm-hmm. her hometown, uh, which she loves very much. Um, you know, she feels that by marrying the husband that her mother has picked for her, you know, is going to be the best thing for her family and for her hometown. Um, and that, you know, she doesn't really want to leave, um, even though she'll be treated like a decoration the rest of her life. So it's like, she's very torn, 
And in order to get out of the village, there's only one way to get out. And it's a very, very rickety old bridge. They take the one night bridge, don't they? They try to. No, I, well... Not yet? I think... I. It Anyway, she falls off a bridge, it doesn't... Yeah, she falls really... off the bridge, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, there's a very clear metaphor here where it's like... The bridge is going to give out if you take even one step back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and she takes a step back and she falls off. Uh, and the boy's like, oh no. Um, and you know, leads a search to go and find her. And, like, eventually she does pop back up. But there's nothing inside anymore. She's just a husk. Um, she just kind of sits in the sunlight and stares blankly ahead. She is a plant zombie. (laughs) There's a few of them in this series. (laughs) Um, and that is why they have called Ginkgo to look at their daughter. Like, um, I don't know. The lights are on, but nobody's home. Please help Mm -hmm. us. Um, and it's like, well, you know, didn't you get what you wanted? You wanted a beautiful object to sell to the head family, and now you have one, so. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Okay, but you shouldn't say it in that many words. Jeez. (laughs) This, uh, this episode is very on the nose with its metaphors, but, uh, I think that's okay. It only has 20 mm-hmm. minutes to get across its message, so. hmm <laughs> It turns out that these rope-like mushi, um, are what has, like, wriggled themselves into her brainstem and taken her over. Uh, taken over her corpse. So she has been dead. She did die when she fell off the bridge because obviously she died when she fell off the bridge. <laughs> it was and a long has fall. Come... It's no recovery yeah. <laughs> from that. <laughs> what has come back to them is not their daughter at all. It's a dead body with a little worm in it that's like moving her arms and legs. That That's that's mostly the setup you need to know. And then what, what happens in the end is that these rope mushi... Um, once a month or whatever, once every, no, once every 10 years, 20 years, Mm -hmm. 20 years or something, they form, uh, a bridge that is infinitely strong in one direction, the direction leading out of town, but snaps in an instant, uh, going the other direction, which is back to the hometown. Mm -hmm. Um... So Ginko's like, look, kid, like, the girl you loved is dead. That is a corpse staring you in the face right now. (laughs) She's not coming back. Um, everyone here is awful and hates you. Um, you should come with me. Yeah, Yeah, just fucking move on, dude. I, like, this town is honestly horrible. I've been to a lot Mm. of towns. This one sucks. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and it's i'm out of especially here. for you like it really does yeah um so just come with me like you know we just have to cross this one night bridge uh and it'll be fine but make sure you don't have any regrets because if you take a single step back towards your hometown uh you're gonna fall to your death and you're gonna become one of the plant zombies just like your girlfriend so what happens uh well (laughs) he's like oh no but my girlfriend and then he takes a step back and then he falls to his death uh and then he comes back as a plant zombie (laughs) Mm -hmm. and it's a very creepy last image um because they give it as like an epilogue narration which they do for a lot of Mushiji episodes where Ginko's like I never returned to that town but I did hear a rumor that 20 years later And then it shows, like, this, you know, the boy, like, just Mm -hmm. with no light in his eyes, just, like, lurch back towards the hometown. That's like, yep, that's creepy. Oop, oop, yep, Mm -hmm. (laughs) mm-hmm. But, uh, you did mention, briefly, 
uh, that the ginkgo focused episodes tend to be some of the strongest in the series. Um, mm-hmm. And I wanted to mention the one that is far and away my favorite episode, uh, mm-hmm. which is Cushion of Grass. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think I'm alone in this. I think this is a lot of people's favorite episode. Yes. Uh, but that is because it's excellent. I watched it again yesterday and I was like, yep, I first saw this episode in college, but it is still perfect. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, the first uh, Ginkgo episode where we get like the first batch of backstory for him sort of explains why he's got white hair and green eyes. I. I. <laughs> <laughs> and also why he's missing the other eye. Um, uh-huh. And why he doesn't have any memories from when he was a kid. Uh, and mm-hmm. also why his name is Ginko. Um, but, so this sort of picks up right after the events of that episode. No, after the events of the second episode about him where he was, like, being taken advantage of by a bunch of Mushishi because he attracts them to mm. him. Um, and, uh, this one more, more so explains, like, not, like, just the physical characteristics of what Yingo looks like, but, Mm. um, why he is the way he is, because he's very much, like, a wise wanderer of the world, (laughs) (laughs) uh, very in tune with nature, very kumbaya, (laughs) Mm. (laughs) <laughs> um but uh and has has a very uh interesting perspective on the relationship between mushi and humans um and this episode basically starts with him lying in the grass uh unconscious because he has been attacked by a bunch of Mushi after being abandoned in the woods by Mushishi who were taking advantage of him. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, he gets picked up by a Mushishi uh, who sort of takes care of the mountain they're on and who sympathizes with his plight and decides to take him in as sort of an apprentice. And he basically is having the issue of the I guess what they call the guardian of the mountain um the leader of the mountain Mm -hmm. which is essentially like the kami right Mm -hmm. uh the mountain god which in the world of mushishi is just like an animal that happens to have been given that mantle and then when the animal dies another animal has to be born to take up the mantle of the mountain god Mm-hmm. And, uh, so, he has divined that the current mountain god is nearing the end of its natural lifespan. But, uh, he's got a problem, which is that the new mountain god hasn't appeared anywhere yet. So he spends the days, like, traversing the mountain, trying to find anything that looks like it could be the new mountain god. Um... And what ends up happening is that the mountain god dies, and mm-hmm. uh, so the Mushishi goes out, and he's like, Ginko, don't fucking go anywhere. Stay, boy. <laughs> stay. <laughs> uh, and Ginko doesn't stay. Um, he goes up in a tree <laughs> because he's feeling very depressed, uh, mm-hmm. and like he doesn't belong anywhere in the world. Uh, he's got no memories, he's got no family. Um, he's just kind of been used and abused by people in Mushi alike, and there's just nowhere for him. So he's up in a tree, feeling sorry for himself. Um, when he looks over and sees a bird's nest, and there's an egg there that is glowing gold, uh, the color of the River of Life, uh, which is a recurring motif throughout the series, And, obviously, this is the new mountain god. And Mm. he, enchanted by it, picks up the egg, looks at it for a while, and he's like, 
this is the opposite of me. This is something that Mm -hmm. has been chosen for a purpose. This is something that belongs. I could just do whatever I want with that power right now. Mm -hmm. And he just has that brief moment of doubt. And he actually is about to go put the egg back. But of course, you know, uh, instead he just fucking drops it. (laughs) <laughs> um yeah because i think a crow fuck no the mom bird attacks him <laughs> mm. <laughs> um and he drops the egg and uh well oops uh the mountain dies <laughs> <laughs> um immediate like cold ominous wind and he's like oh shit <laughs> uh-oh uh-oh And he, like, takes this egg and is like, oh my god, please, master, help me. Help me not murder the god of the mountain. (laughs) Um. And, like, I think he ends up getting knocked out somehow. And he's there with the egg still in his hands at the edge of the river of life. Uh, which exists behind your second eyelid, this part of the uh, the lore of the series. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're all connected to the river of life. Um, and he looks over and sees, like, a ring of, like, flames, and he's like, I have the feeling that if I go over there, I'm not going to come back. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but then he's like, but I never belonged anywhere anyway, so it doesn't matter. And he goes. And he meets there uh, the natural order of things itself. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And it just takes the form of these hands, and it reaches out and gestures for the egg, and he gives it the egg. And it's like, okay, then now go. It beckons for him to leave, and then disappears. Um, and, uh, so he, then he wakes up, and he meets his master, and the master's like, well, if the natural order of things itself took the egg from you, then that means that someday a new mountain god will be born on this mountain, and things will go back Mm -hmm. to normal, because that's the natural order of things. And, like, he has this, uh... You know, he says, like, you're gonna get out of here tomorrow because I can't forgive you and I'm never going to see you again. But Mm -hmm. then he gives him, like, these parting words that, like, I'll literally start crying, like, just sobbing, just, like, quoting them here. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But but he's like, remember this. There's no such thing as a place where any of us are not allowed to exist. And the same goes for you. The natural order judged you and allowed you to return. There's no place in the world where you do not belong. Such a reassuring thing, but also so sad. Mm -hmm. But it really just sums up, like, the central thesis of the series, which is that the world isn't going to forgive you but it's not going to condemn you either. Mm-hmm. It is as it is. Mm-hmm. And you make whatever you make of it. Yeah, and also people, each individual doesn't have to have a, like, a purpose or a reason to exist aside from just existing, right? Yeah, and also like... Not just people, but everything. Everything. I really love, yeah. like, the last, like, shot of that episode where, like, you know, it's, again, like, the poetic mirroring of the beginning where he was lying mm-hmm. unconscious uh, in the grass after having been basically, you know, abandoned by humans, told that he doesn't have anywhere to belong. And at the mm-hmm. end of the episode, having realized that He is simply another part of the natural order of things. Um, He, you know, starts his journey that continues to this day. 
uh, by, you know, finding a nice grassy field to uh, lay Take down on for the night. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a cushion of grass, obviously. Mm-hmm. Just is like, you know, this, this is, it's okay for me to be here because, because I am here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's okay for me to be alive because I am alive. Um, but also what I love about that, uh, shot is that he goes and rubs his eye, which, uh, after he had killed the mountain god, um, and he goes to the river of life, uh, his eye socket, which, uh, we know from previous episode, he has a mushi in there that Mm -hmm. is the reason that he's half blind and has this creepy empty black eye socket, (laughs) um, and it, like, it starts hurting because it's trying to crawl towards the River of Life. Um, and, uh, he's like, you know, why do you have to be there? Like, why are you always just getting in my way? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like, in the end, you see him just sort of making peace with the fact that this Mushi that's in his eye, that has caused him a lot of pain, it's robbed him of all of his memories... That that Mushi has just as much of a reason and a justification for being here as he does. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's alive in the world, and therefore it is allowed to be alive in the world. And uh, that ends up leading into, you know, basically his entire philosophy on life, and why he really doesn't like killing Mushi when he doesn't have to. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so uh, this episode... (laughs) Uh, <laughs> ties into I think another question we got about like if we relate to any episodes but this came mm-hmm. around the same time I watched Evangelion for the first time which was in the middle of uh, a really bad depression mm-hmm. um, in college and like this episode was like a religious fucking experience for me the first time I watched it Like, Mm -hmm. I was crying and crying and crying, and I wasn't even sad. I just felt like I'd been purified. Uh, Mm -hmm. So, that's my favorite episode. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's one that is so powerful because no matter who you are, no matter your place in life, no matter your background, situation... Everyone, or most people, majority of people, I would say, has had that moment of, why am I here? Like, what what purpose mm-hmm. do I have? Where do I fit into this, you know, messy, messy puzzle of a world? Mm-hmm. And, and it can be quite disheartening, especially if you're someone who's never felt part of the majority or if you've had a personal struggle of any sort or you just have a lot of self-doubt or you don't have a plan for the future or whatever it may be right but Mm -hmm. something that can tell you can reassure you with words of it doesn't matter so much as to what what purpose you have. There's no grander scheme or picture or plan for people. It's the only thing that is important is the fact that you're here and is the fact that you have, you're, you're here, you, you exist and you're, you have the chance to make choices. You have the chance to live your life however you want to. And that's just mm-hmm. so exhilarating and so freeing mm-hmm. for a lot of people that I think even though this is a wholly like supernatural fiction of a story, along with you know all of the various little moral plays and all of these other myriad of human emotions that get tapped into with Mushishi, but The reason Ginkgo works as a protagonist so much is that he embodies this 
having grown up with this background and with all of these things having happened to him, he embodies this freedom and this relationship with himself and his place in the world that I think people yearn for, that people search for. And Mm -hmm. even if they're not consciously doing it, um, so I think it's very easy to, to grow or to attach yourself to, um, to Ginko as a character, even though, you know, he's, he's markedly different from you and I, right? It's Mm -hmm. not, it's not our differences that define that relationships. It, it's how, again, tying into this idea of like everything in life, everything has, you know, belongs regardless of its Mm -hmm. purpose or if, he always comes at people as they are. Like, he doesn't mm-hmm. really expect anything from anyone. He doesn't really go out of his way to judge anyone. And he doesn't do that for the Mushi in the episode either. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also think, like, that episode is a very nice reminder that, like, no matter who in the human world tries to judge you, mm-hmm. the natural world never will. Um, you know, maybe if you're feeling judged and, you know, stepped on and, like, you're just not having a good week, sometimes it's nice to just take a walk in nature. Um, and I think that that's another, I guess, uh, more, less life-shattering, more, like, cute little message that Mm -hmm. Mushishi has throughout its run, which is that, you know... Sometimes it's nice to just go out and appreciate nature. There's a lot of cool things out there (laughs) that simply are. They don't have any Mm -hmm. reason to be there. And yet they're there, and they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, with that, uh, I want to ask you what some of your favorite uh, episodes on the lighter side of the Mushishi episode spectrum uh, (laughs) are. I really loved or love not it's not a past tense i yeah. don't remember the exact name but the one about the traveling rain the girl who brought rain with her cloudless um, rain yes <laughs> i have um, my notes <laughs> <laughs> um and for this story it's literally the the character as she travels the rain follows her and so she can't stay in one place for too long or else Mm -hmm. the the town will be washed away and Mm -hmm. so she's she's made this decision to keep well over the course of the the episode she makes the decision that she will continue traveling continue seeing the world continue providing a service to these you know um drought ridden villages that need the rain she um with the knowledge that she possibly will never be able to settle down and to form Mm -hmm. a family like build a family unit that most young women of her age have uh you know husband children um town to to bring her in but Mm -hmm. Although it is melancholy, it's I think it's quite hopeful for her own perspective and for her realizing that although it is, it's difficult, and it does mean that she hasn't had that more general community structure. She's had such a positive effect in so many people's lives, and so many people rely on her and respect her and have been saved by her um, Mm -hmm. just by being there, that she has kind of grown this community and this family that love her, even if it's not the more conventional uh, ways that people might expect. I, Mm -hmm. yeah, I really like this one. Yeah, I like that one too. Um, And 
Uh, I have just a couple other thoughts on that one. But, um, mm-hmm. for one, I, I like the Mushi in this one. Uh, it's, mm-hmm. like, takes the form of a heat mirage that can be caught. Mm-hmm. <laughs> which I think is just a very cute little idea. I don't know, I like the ones that sort of appeal to that, like, childlike sense of wonder. It's like, you know, because when you're a kid, I feel like most kids, like, when they see heat mirages when they're a kid, or like, that looks just like water. I wish I could catch it, you know, uh-huh. and splash around in that puddle. And it's kind of like this fascinating, mysterious thing that there's this puddle that you can see so clearly off in the distance, but you'll never be able to get there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, the idea of one that, like, you actually can go and splash around in is kind of a fun idea. (laughs) Um, But then also, this one I think is another one that um, touches on the idea of, like, grief and acceptance. Um, Mm -hmm. Shortly after she steps on this heat mirage, uh, basically, it starts raining in her town and it doesn't stop for Mm -hmm. months and months um and her childhood best friend uh ends up getting a terrible fever and dying because the rain just never let up Mm -hmm. um and she was unable to mourn like physically because you know she cannot cry that's one of the Mm -hmm. things with this mushi that afflicts her is that Basically, all of the fluid that should be coming out of her body is being borrowed to turn into rain. So she can't sweat, and she can't cry. Um, Which I feel like is a very obvious, like, metaphor for sort of not struggling to have that moment of catharsis, where you can Mm -hmm. finally get over this period of grief and mourning. Um... You know, the feeling of needing to cry but not being able to uh, is one that I think everyone has experienced. Um, And the sort of resolution to her little mushi affliction is Ginko is like, well, the period between, like, you arriving in a town and it starting to rain above you is getting uh, longer and longer, which means that the mushi is coming to its natural, the end of its natural lifespan, and you really Mm -hmm. just have to wait it out. Um... And she's like, you know, someday when the rain stops, I want to lay down roots somewhere, but I think it's okay to just, like, like, she's basically like, it, you know, until then, you know, I'm going to give myself as long as I need, you know, Mm -hmm. until the day that my tears come again, I will continue to be this bringer of rain. Um... And she says, like, you know, uh, I I wrote this quote just because it was pretty. (laughs) She's like, until that day comes, I will go side by side with the rain like a a cloud and drift. Yeah, it's a good episode. (laughs) (laughs) It's a good episode. I also, and this is also, I I, mm, I don't, forgive me because I don't remember the title of this one either but the one about the bridge like where the bridge would always be washed out and they yeah yeah that guy was like i have an idea and everyone's like you're crazy and then the mm-hmm. at the end his idea works and you're like hey <laughs> what is this one called raindrops and rainbows mm. yeah uh that one's really sweet too because it's it's another like cute little idea right because it's like yeah Another thing that as a kid, like, you're always looking at and being like, I wish I could go there, but Mm -hmm. it's just a trick of the light, which is a rainbow. Um, And Mm -hmm. he's searching for a rainbow that can be touched. (laughs) The rainbow in this episode isn't technically a mushi. It's like something Mm. that comes up from time to time in the series called a nagare mono, which uh, is like all of the names for things in the series are very like clever and like cute uh this just means like something that flows um and Mm -hmm. ginko describes it as something that resembles a flood or a typhoon in that it happens for a reason but it doesn't have a purpose Mm -hmm. um just like a phenomenon a natural phenomenon Mm -hmm. 
I, I liked those a lot whenever they showed up. But, um, yeah, that one's a very sweet episode. It's sort of about a, uh, this guy who has been working himself to death trying to become as good of a bridge builder as his father and older brother before him. Uh, but, you know, having worked himself to his very, very limit, uh, he is sort of taking a break from that by chasing after this rainbow that his father was always going nuts for. Um, and it's got this theme about the importance of, like, mental health breaks. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because it's like he gets back from finding this rainbow and he has a brilliant idea and makes, you know, solves the bridge problem that his father and older brother, despite being better bridge builders than him, uh, weren't able to solve because he just, Mm -hmm. you know... With his fresh mind, he was able to come up with the solution. So, it's very sweet. Uh, one that I really like is uh, really early in the series. Um, it's called Tender Horns. Oh, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I guess this one has like a couple moments that are like, ah, creepy. But I, I think it's pretty sweet overall. <laughs> um, the I conclusion think, of it agree. is very sweet as well. So, basically... This t- this is one of those that takes place in, you know, deep in the mountains, in this little mountain village in the middle of winter, uh, when every sound is muffled. Um, and it's a very, very beautiful episode. I just love just, like, living in it, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. It, like, reminds me of when I used to, like, go skiing with my family. So there's a bunch of people in this town who are afflicted with sudden temporary deafness. Uh, so Ginkgo gets called to the town. And he's like, oh yeah, this is really easy to fix. Uh, it's a little snail looking mushi that eats sound. Uh, there's no sound around because you live in a mountain village in the middle of winter. So it's curling up uh, in your inner ear matrix, the, the bit that looks like a snail. Mm-hmm. It's curling up in there, and it's eating all of the sound that your ear takes in. Um, and, like, if you pour salt into your ear, it'll come out, because it's a snail. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there's a little kid who has a similar issue, but it's the opposite. As sort of a incidental side effect, he's grown little horns on his forehead. Uh, but his issue is not that he hears nothing, it's that he hears too much. Um, every sound, every tiny little sound that every little insect, every little snowflake makes is amplified to a horrible extent. Um, and he's just constantly bombarded with this horrible cacophony. And, uh, it turns out that this is a sort of a mushi that lives symbiotically with the sound-eating one, uh, but curls in the opposite direction and eats silence. Mm -hmm. So the first one eats all the sound, and then the second one eats the silence created by the one that made all the sound. (laughs) Ate ate all the sound, I mean. But basically it turns out that this kid, his mom had the same affliction, and... Uh, as the sounds became louder and louder for her, her body got weaker and weaker. This is sort of like how G was, you were explaining earlier with like mold, like gradually Mm -hmm. making you sicker and sicker. That tends to be how Mushi operate. Um, so she's getting weaker and weaker. And right at the end of her life, um, she calls her son over and claps her hands over his ears. And mm-hmm. she said something in that moment, but he's having trouble remembering it. Um, and so we spend the episode with Ginko trying to figure out how to cure this kid. And the kid trying to remember what his mother told him. And uh, at the end, we get the very heartwarming sort of realization that um, she had basically found the cure for the mushi that was afflicting her, which was... Um, forcing it to listen to sound, basically. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
So she had clapped her ears, her hands over her own ears, and realized that the muscles moving in her wrist uh, make a sound like the gently flowing lava out of a volcano. And she was, she put her wrists over her son's ears and was like, listen to this, this is my sound. Um, and unfortunately it was too late for her, but uh, her son, it's not too late for him. So he claps his hands over his ears and listens to the sound of his own body and the horns fall off. Um, as, you know, he's finally able to find closure for the loss of his mother as well, because he's found this wonderful little connection to her. Uh, that, you know, basically he can feel like he's reuniting with her in some small way every time he claps his hands over his ears, which is very sweet. Mm -hmm. um, and I also liked that uh, Ginko took the larger horns from his forehead as payment for his services, but he lets the kid keep the littler horns. <laughs> <laughs> which is cute. <laughs> it's like keeping your baby teeth. Uh-huh. It's a cute episode. I like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very sweet. Yep. And it's also, because it's so early in the series, I think it it gives, especially compared to the first two episodes, which were a little bit more heavy, a little bit creepier, um, mm -hmm. it gives that kind of brevity mm -hmm. <laughs> that, um, <laughs> well, the second episode wasn't scary, scary, but it was quite creepy. <laughs> Yeah. It, well, the like first the... episode's melancholy, but the second one's creepy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The second so, one's the, um... the eye one. <laughs> <laughs> so, the those the first three, so inclusive of this one, really gives a good insight into what this series is. It runs mm -hmm. on very different, but similar kind of wavelength throughout it no no it just again despite this being an anthology or an extremely episodic series that does have you know some some episodes that are straight up horror some that are a bit more heartwarming mm -hmm. some that are dealing with mm -hmm. grief or with loss or with um frustration or whatever it may be nothing feels out of place and it all feels mm -hmm. like one you know, whole, it, they all, it mm -hmm. all merges very well together. But to that point, this being the third episode of the first three, um, gives that levity to after something that was melancholy, something that was just, yes, pretty creepy, <laughs> um, or horror filled, <laughs> you get that little bit of, oh, like there's some warmth and softness and yeah. hope in this series as well. And cuteness. Yes. Cute children. Yeah. Oh, well, all three of the <laughs> first three episodes yeah. have cute children, but yeah. the first two have, <laughs> like, not necessarily good stuff happening to those cute children, so... <laughs> yeah. Uh, especially episode two. That one's creepy. Mm. Um, <laughs> it's good, though. I like that one, actually, quite a bit. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, and then I guess just one more that I wanted to bring up, if that's okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, because this was one that I remembered not liking that much when I first saw it in high school, but I really mm -hmm. liked it on rewatch, so I just wanted to bring it up. I think it's one that you've mentioned liking before, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, this one is, uh, called String from the Sky. Ah, um, yes. Yeah. So this one's another sweet one, um, and seems to be sort of very, very loosely inspired by the Tanabata story. Mm -hmm. um, there is a theme of the Milky Way, uh, in this case explained as sort of a reflection of the river of light deep beneath the earth, um, which I thought was a very beautiful image. You actually, you get the image too of like, the Milky Way, like, meeting the River of Light at the horizon. 
um, and it's very pretty. <laughs> but uh, this one is another love story between classes. Uh, the man, in this case, is a young lord, and the woman is uh, his baby sister's uh, nurse. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, basically, this girl is very much ostracized by the town for, I guess, seducing the young lord of this estate, but also for what we know, uh, as viewers, as the fact that she's capable of seeing Mushi and is talking mm -hmm. about seeing them. Um, but, of course, the villagers have no idea what's happening. They're like, oh, she's weird. She keeps talking about these strange things that aren't there. And one day, she is sort of with uh, this man who she loves. They want to get married. He's gone to his father to try and get him to accept their marriage. But it's, it's not going well. <laughs> um, and he's like, it's okay, I'm going to convince him. But they've been doing this for a while and it's not going anywhere. And one day, they're just together up on a hill, and she sees a string coming down from the sky. And she's curious, so she tugs on it, and goes flying up into the air. Uh, and disappears. Away. She's whisked away. <laughs> um, and... The fiancé does not know what has happened to her. She's just disappeared. Mm -hmm. uh, and no one will, of course, believe him when he says that she says she saw a string coming from the sky and she tugged it and disappeared. So now they think that he's crazy, too. And Ginkgo shows up and he's like, Well, I don't know what to tell you, but your wife is right there. Like, she's mm -hmm. right there. I can see her. <laughs> Um, she's just chillin', uh, halfway in between the Mushi world and the human world, which is why you can't see her. He says that this string was let down by a Mushi that essentially is explained as, like, the reason wayward stars exist. Um, mm -hmm. so again, it's kind of a cute little explanation for a natural phenomenon. Um, and... He's like, in order to get her to come back to the human world, you have to make it her feel anchored to the human world. You have to make mm -hmm. her feel like she wants to be here. That's like, that's the crux of how to defeat a lot of Mushi, is to just get people to feel like they want to do the right thing. <laughs> um... <laughs> So it's, you know, it's a very, it's a very tricksy situation. It's mm. like psychological and shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this fiancé has, uh, his work set out for him, making his fiancé feel like she wants to be here. Basically, like, Ginko leaves for a while and he comes back and she has disappeared even more. <laughs> um... And the guy's like, look, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I just, I can't get my dad to forgive our marriage. And Ginko's mm -hmm. like, you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> dude, dude, <laughs> what so the hell? You're so stupid and dumb <laughs> and stupid. Uh, don't you see that you need to stop worrying about getting other people to accept your wife? Everyone else thinks she's crazy. They've always thought she was crazy. You weren't going to change their minds to begin with. Your problem is that you won't accept her. Mm. <laughs> and he's like, oh my god, what? What? <laughs> what? Um, and he's like, you've got to act like you believe in her. You know? <laughs> and so it gets very sweet from there because he's like, you know what? You're right. I love her and I want her back. Even though I can't see her, I'm going to trust that she's there. And he like he has a little wedding ceremony with no bride. <laughs> <laughs> um, just an empty spot set out for his bride and mm. like 
the the sake cup he's like i don't know if you're in front of me or over here and he's like maybe you're over here and holds it out for her it's very cute um (laughs) he like sits out on the balcony talking to her for hours having these one-sided conversations and everyone is like well that dude's completely lost it he's completely off his rocker we don't need to deal with him anymore um but even if the whole town decides he's not worth dealing with anymore that's okay because eventually she reappears right next to him and you know they live out the rest of their lives together and it's very cute and um you know it it very much reads as sort of an analogy for uh living with mental illness specifically living as a woman with mental illness Mm -hmm. um trying to get people to like believe your experience yeah um i feel like this is an ongoing thing in mushishi is that a lot of the men in mushishi really just need to take a big drink of Believe women juice. <laughs> well, I was about to say the amount of cishet men that Ginko is like, guys, uh, maybe listen to the women in your lives for like one Maybe second. they're not fucking crazy. Maybe for you like, should stop assuming that every woman who tells you something that you didn't know before now <laughs> is a fucking lunatic. <laughs> for literally one second can you guys just drink the respect women juice and like please there's your lives would be so much easier and he's like and my life would be so much easier you probably it's just uh <laughs> <laughs> it's horrible uh, but in this case um ginkgo is able to get this man, this fucking man, to take a drink of the respect women juice, and you know what? He gets to live the rest of his days in happiness and peace because of it. Mm. <laughs> and so does she. <laughs> With his loving wife. That, and you're, yes. oh, who could who could have known twas as simple as listening to your assumingly a loving partner who you love and adore. Uh, But yeah, I thought this one was really sweet (laughs) and Mm. uh, probably one of the stronger takes on this particular corner of uh, Mushishi's overall thematic goals. Mm. Yes. Uh, Brilliant. (laughs) (laughs) Feminism. (laughs) <laughs> the original feminist Ginko, right there. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. There's a couple episodes where I'm like, mm. <laughs> mm, I mean, that's true. Mm. I love the I I say I love I love when that it was a sex episode in the later or the part story in the latter half of the manga. Where he saves that girl and she's just like totally has the hearts for him and he's like, I'm not even no. gonna acknowledge that. Please <laughs> leave me alone. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> Our asexual prince. <laughs> he's just like, mm, mm, um, I'm fine. It's because he's got the hearts for Tanya. That's why yes. um, nobody can tell me any different. <laughs> <laughs> I mean,. I don't think that's a controversial statement. I think no. everyone Is agrees. there any other option? Is there a <laughs> single other option? There's you gonna no put him sing- with the collector guy? Ew. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> <laughs> he would he would sooner like just walk into the sea than be paired up with collector guy. He's like nothing. He's done that a few times. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Dear. Yeah. <laughs> How many strokes can one man have? <laughs> <laughs> the the time he sells that the kimono to him and he's like, Oh yeah, for sure it will show the yeah, special stuff. That's smoke. definitely that's that's the real one with the mushi in it. Yep. <laughs> yep. How does he know? He can't even see mushi. 
I know. <laughs> Ginkgo's oh. like, I do not deal with you because I want to. <laughs> <laughs> this is a relationship of necessity. And honestly, if there was any other option, literally any <laughs> other option, I would take it. Uh, what is the next question? Well, I think we've covered all of stories on shelves as questions. So, uh, <laughs> after that, unless there was particular elements in the art and story, but I think we've already discussed that. So following that, uh, mm-hmm. 365 Days of 801 mm-hmm. um, no, said that they really loved the anime, although the manga is too expensive in print. Check out the digital release if you haven't. Um, as someone who loves folklore, I like spotting parallels to other cultures. Did you spot any similarities to other cultures and other representations of folklore in other manga slash anime? And have you watched the live action version? For me, I was mostly drawing parallels to like where it's coming from within Japanese folklore. It's a very mm-hmm. Japanese series. Um... And I would say, uh, I'm going to use this as a, as a point to just quickly plug, um, if you are a fan of Mushishi, the anime or the manga, you should absolutely, absolutely, absolutely pick up uh, Shigeru Mizuki's Tono Monogatari. Yes. Um, you will love it. It's great. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh... I was trying to rewatch the series with this in mind, but to be honest, I'm not very good with folklore that is not of the weebish variety. So <laughs> I I would like to turn this over to G. Uh, all right. Um, so I will say that there, with most folklore, um, especially indigenous stories and folklore, there's typically a parallel to to other stories especially creation stories like where humanity came from how a country is Mm -hmm. built um you see it a lot um with whether it be southeast asian cultures or um pacific islander cultures or native american and south native south american culture all all across right there's a lot mm-hmm. of similarities to to ver- similar sh- ideas, right? The idea of humanity being built from clay or from dirt by the gods. The idea of this river or this flowing creature of um, symbolic of life and the the path of life and and pulling into yeah. um, how also the. We- um- the eternal tree or the tree of life pops yes. up in Mushishi as well. Yes, and that's so the tree of life and a lot of that symbology is very, very like for me, that's a lot of you see that a lot in European historical folklore, um, amidst, you know, being part of very humanity's connection with with the natural world has always been a thing like obviously because we (laughs) we exist within the natural world we are in fact uh animals (laughs) yes and (laughs) and for majority of human history we lived in conjunction in coexistence with our natural environment or with the world around us whether that be you know through understanding the seasons whether that be knowing where to hunt and when to hunt what kind of animals to look out for how to um like what animals or what seasons or what topography you can use to your advantage for whatever it's Mm. it's a very fundamental part of our existence and it always has been because as Ray said, we are animals. We may be a little bit more evolved than some of our counterparts, but we are Arguably. just one part of this giant puzzle that is the world. So it's hard to pull any very specific representation outside of some obvious that are very 
Japanese, understandably, because it is a Japanese setting. As Ray said, the the idea of Tanabata and the that with the string string in the sky. But mm-hmm. I always see the the one that always jumps out at me is this the river of light and river of life. Um this this flowing that flowing golden river that exists beyond your second eyelid that you can see but you shouldn't as a mortal human you shouldn't be spend too much time around because it will draw you in um and never let you go and it's that Mm -hmm. idea of this returning back to this circle of life right the the flow of time the flow of existence itself it's for me, like I, I look at that and it reminds me a lot of um, here in Australia, um, in Aboriginal culture and folklore, there's the rainbow serpent and that is emblematic of life on earth for the indigenous people of Australia. And so, <clears throat> although that's not like actually a a body of water it's still that idea of that flow of that movement of that change throughout time place and understanding that it's a natural continuation of something and so you yeah it's it's <laughs> when you make <laughs> when you pull representations i you know i could name and I'm not going to because I'm terrible with names, but there it's the no no folklore is wholly unique to that area. Um, when you look at similar topography, when you look at similar climates, um, when you look at similar social structures, there are always similarities. And to that, it it means that Mushishi is almost this modern modern retelling of folklore just ties back into this history as we mentioned or we spoke about a little bit earlier of oral tradition of perpetuating or or passing on stories of completing and sharing history with other people through the smaller parts of experience and that's always what st- folklore has been it's been messages to teach the current generation and future generations and passing on experience and, and giving warnings and, and whatever else. And whether that's through, you know, our more recognizable folklore from Asia, from Europe, from very South America, from various parts of the world, whether it's the idea of scripture, what would become religious texts, these are all these all fundamentally come from a, the same idea of passing on oral tradition and messages and lessons and sharing the human experience throughout the generations. So that might not really answer the question, but it's if there's a familiarity to other cultures especially a specific story that you know I would argue that that's because ultimately the human experience is very universal Um, we find similar things creepy we find similar things Mm -hmm. heartwarming we find similar things upsetting or important or you know uh, exciting regardless of who we are, where we came from. Um, And that's just part of life. Again, it's just being part of this larger piece of of ourselves and and humanity's humanity's existence on Earth up until now. Yeah. Um, So, Um. yes. Yeah, I just uh, was listening to you and also going through my notes a little bit and uh, just thought I'd bring up a couple that um, 
I remember thinking of when I was going through the series. First of all, Mm -hmm. I think, like, I brought up the episode um, Windraiser earlier on, which is about uh, that it's it's bad to whistle at night. You shouldn't do it or something bad Mm -hmm. will happen. Um, Which is, I mean, this is a superstition that exists the world over, and it exists for a very practical reason, which is you shouldn't Mm -hmm. be making loud piercing noises in the middle of the night when it's dark and there's predators out it's a bad idea Mm -hmm. (laughs) um something bad will happen (laughs) as well as there's an episode focusing around figuring out why so many shells have suddenly started appearing on the beach Mm -hmm. um and it ends up being a harbinger of a red tide um There's a lot of episodes like that that have to deal with uh, superstitions and old wives' tales surrounding seafaring and fishing and living on the seashore uh, Mm -hmm. that you're going to find in other uh, coastal cultures throughout the world. Um, I was thinking, actually, of String from the Sky, the episode I had just been talking about. When I was watching this episode, I was actually... The whole story of, like, the solution to the episode's conflict being that the guy has to believe in his wife, believe Mm -hmm. that she is there coming for him, that, you know, no matter how much time it takes, he has to be patient and he has to keep up with believing in her and not doubting her, reminds me of the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. There's the episode that is based loosely on the Japanese myth of the Hagoromo, um, which is called Thread of Life. Uh, And I think it's interesting because the subtitles actually refer to the Heavenly Maidens, um, the Tenyo, uh, that are referenced in the episode. They translate that to Angel, uh, Mm. which I thought was an interesting sort of unintentional crossing of cultures there um there's the idea of liquor being uh some sort of like sacred yeah sacred like representing like vigor and life Mm -hmm. uh there's an episode called the sleeping mountain um wherein the male protagonist of the episode um has become this mountain god after being forced to ingest the heart or something of the previous mountain god by his wife who tricked him Hmm. this there's another story that's about like a man becoming immortal after being forced to ingest the heart of a dragon by his wife um in european folklore i don't remember what country but that's another type of story that sort of exists in a lot of different cultures there's a lot of things Mm -hmm. um yeah the idea of one's shadow like representing one's soul comes up Mm -hmm. a couple times in a couple different episodes so yeah i guess once i actually like sit down to think about it it's it's kind of fun to (laughs) think Mm -hmm. of the parallels but um yeah, I mean, folklore is folklore, and humans are humans. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of, there's a lot of parallels wherever you go. Uh, yeah, the idea of the second eyelid, I believe, also comes from, like, Buddhist mm. folklore. Uh, the, the second half of that, or, the, yeah, the second question that 365 Days of 801 asked was, have you seen the live-action version of Mushishi? There's a film adaptation. I have. It really leans into the horror aspect Mm -hmm. of it. It's quite tense. Um, There's not a lot of the levity that we see in in um, the the anime or the the manga. Um, Although, so part of from what I can remember forgive me, it's been a little while since I've seen it. Um, it adapts the the first three episodes um, of what, maybe maybe some of Ginko's backstory. Um, it's 
within the film itself, it is quite episodic, and it does cover multiple storylines of Ginko's travels, but it is more serious, it is more focused on Ginko as a person. Um, it also, yeah, includes Tanya and some of the other storylines that we see pop up. I'm trying to remember who the director is. One second. Because he's quite well known. Oh, Otomo. Otomo's the director. Oh. <laughs> um, Katsuhiro Otomo. So, um, Damn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> For those who don't know, is the mangaka of Akira. Um, So, quite different from from his own works that he he wrote, um, illustrated. But it's um, it's an interesting curiosity. I don't know that it did very well, um, and. I don't know how many people who even are like Mushishi fans are are familiar with it, but you can buy it legally on English subtitled DVD um, quite readily. I don't think they they still produce them, but it's not. I I doubt it's a film that's in high demand, um, so you can probably get a copy somewhere. There you go. <laughs> what I really want to see is, like, there was a stage adaptation that was, like, mm. art theater. Um, and there was, like, a clip, a very short clip that, like, showed a bit of what they were doing with, like, the sound design and stuff. I would have loved to experience that. It sounds like it was really beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously you can't just buy that one on DVD. You kind of have to have been there. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I was so, I, because I remember when the news of that being announced um, happened, and I was very jealous of the idea that people would be able to go and experience that on stage, mm-hmm. um, but mm-hmm. obviously I don't understand Japanese, and it would have just been a waste for me anyway, but I, mm, I wish one day... <laughs> So, yes, there's been a couple various adaptations of Mushishi, although for the full... And I, I've said this before, that I do appreciate different adaptations of things. I think it gives interesting insight to the creative mm-hmm. process and how different directors or different authors or whomever, like what they emphasize is important and how different creative teams can approach the same material in different ways. Um, but if you do mm-hmm. want the uh, the closest adaptation to the manga, then your best bet is the anime. And you really can't beat it uh, compared to other adaptations or of the other adaptations that I've experienced at least. Um, but our final question is from... Uh, mech anime review or the legend of scott mecca who Mm -hmm. asked a friend and i once considered this series as mushi to be similar to what would appear in ghibli films do you think it's possible that ghibli was an influence uh i think absolutely like you know Mm -hmm. uh ghibli honestly has some influence on like a lot of Japanese media, it's very much a part of the zeitgeist. It would be like Mm -hmm. asking if Disney had some sort of influence on any animated media in America, (laughs) you know? It's like, probably. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I did, like, mark in my notes when I was rewatching the series, uh, the episode I mentioned a little bit ago called The Sleeping Mountain. Uh, Mm -hmm. The Mushishi in this episode looks very much inspired by some of the older man designs in uh, Ghibli films, and this has a very clear, like, Princess Mononoke, you know, mm. don't attempt to control this much greater and more ancient force than humans have any business trying to control. Like, you're just a part of nature. You can't control nature. Mm-hmm. Um, 
But I mean, I feel like in terms of like an environmental message, that's not a message that Ghibli has ever owned. Like, it's yeah. fairly common in Japanese media. So, they don't own environmentalism. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. But, I mean, to the extent that, like, most anime are, you know. Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd say that although it's, like, there's a possibility and to the extent that every animation is going to be influenced by its predecessors and by the largest influence in whichever market they're in, um, I would say that there's no, like, direct parallels that are seem mm-hmm. extremely obvious between Mushishi yeah. and, and um, Ghibli or Ghibli. I would say that you would see... I would make more the argument of stuff like Mizuki's work or, you know, a mm. number of stuff that focuses on Yo-kai. mythology and, and folklore, um, to which there's numerous, right, within Japan and everywhere. But it's an interesting thing to consider. And I would say that the, the detail uh, is at... The detail towards character animation, maybe yes, because of how Mm -hmm. finely attuned that is to the small realities of how people move is something that you do see a lot in Ghibli films. Yeah. Um, Also, like, some of the ways that, like, the children in the series, their faces are animated kind of reminds mm -hmm. me a bit of Ghibli. It's just the, uh, the the way of drawing adorable children that <laughs> everyone has inherited from Ghibli. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you want us, if you want anyone to care about a child in twenty minutes, then you have to make it as appealing as possible, as likable. <laughs> yeah, as possible. you have to make it the object known as a child. <laughs> <laughs> as appealing as possible. That was a very human way to express that sentiment, G. <laughs> well. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'd be interested in uh, hearing your reasoning, you and your friend's reasoning that you came up with, um, and the parallels that you found uh, between... Ghibli movies and Mushishi. Yes, yes. Um, but that's that's all. That's everything. Those are all the questions. Um, mm-hmm. We spoke at length about many episodes and or slash chapters within Mushishi, but honestly, we barely brushed the surface of what is contained in the series there are so many when you look at the anime adaptation there's over 50 episodes worth of content um mm-hmm. <laughs> there's a lot of mushishi to love 10 volumes of a fantastic series that just continues to be really consistent and and an extremely consistent um anime adaptation as well that even if you were one of those people who didn't heed our warnings and just decide to listen to our spoilers um, anyway, but mm-hmm. haven't experienced Mushishi yourself, there's so many fantastic episodes. Um, I would argue there isn't really a bad episode within the bunch. Um, I don't like that milk episode. That one makes me uncomfy. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that one was kind of sexist to be honest mm. but otherwise I don't think there's any other like real duds they're all pretty at the very least it's well worth the read well worth the watch if you haven't yet do if you have and you're looking for similar I- similar series or similar um, ideas We've mentioned a number of titles and series and, uh, you know, creations that may also appeal to you. Um, 
and yeah I mean I just what what more is there to say right <laughs> Mushu is great <laughs> and everyone should go read slash watch it yeah um Ginko's pretty <laughs> that's a good thing to say I'm gonna I'm going to share a personal story um but <laughs> w- <laughs> once I say once it's probably it was a while ago now maybe 10 years ago um and so my sister and I were at a um work function well a work my sister and I were together and we were at an expo that we were there for work um but we were just mm-hmm. kind of you know faffing about we weren't we we're on our time off and as part of this as part of this expo there was um name tags like sticker name tags that um you could write whatever you want on them and my sister genius that she was um this is gonna sound really weird uh, <laughs> but on her she wrote ginkgo's nose because she just thinks he has a really good nose i'm like i well okay <laughs> Um, and then she, she wore that and then, um, didn't have an, like an explanation for that in case anyone questioned what the hell that meant. Um, <laughs> and she was questioned. She's like, oh, what's like, oh, that's interesting. What's Ginko's nose? And me, brilliant sister that I am. And obviously, um, I guess just in in our panic um i said oh it's the name of a band and they're like oh that's cool and then (laughs) so we dodged that bullet um (laughs) (laughs) so to that poor woman who was working at a booth um at at this expo 10 years ago i'm sorry i lied to you it wasn't a band name it was just a incredibly weeby reference that um (laughs) <laughs> didn't even make sense at the time. Certainly doesn't make sense now. And uh yeah. <laughs> that's my story. <laughs> yep. That's we weebs, we do do things like that, don't we? Ah, <laughs> 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 oh, siblings. <laughs> Your sister sounds like a hoot. <laughs> She is certainly a character. <laughs> but with that, we have come to the end of our episode on the wonderfully done 10 volume series Mushishi, which again, you can watch the anime via various streaming services, although I would suspect you can probably watch all of it on Crunchyroll now since the merger. Um, because Funimation doesn't have a separate, um, streaming service anymore. And if you are wanting to read the manga, you can purchase it digitally from Kodansha in its entirety. Um, it might pop up on a Humble Bundle, so if you're wanting to wait till then, that might be a good option too. Or of course... Um, I'm sure copies are still floating around in library systems. It's always good to inquire there. Um, But yeah. (laughs) Thank you everyone Mm -hmm. who sent in your wonderful questions as always. Next month. Next month we are doing a topic episode. Where we will, Ray and I will be discussing discontinued series. Series that... Got a start, were, were released partially in English, and then dropped for whatever reason. Whether that be low sales, whether that be because the publisher went bankrupt. <laughs> um, <laughs> whether it just wasn't, maybe maybe the series itself got cancelled. Um, you know, there's a myriad of reasons, and unfortunately there's plenty of manga that is in this particular situation in English. So um, if you have any questions about that topic or a specific series that has been discontinued, um, maybe mention your own favorites that 
came to an untimely end, um, let us know, either in the comment section down below if you're listening to this on YouTube, or uh, on Twitter when I ask for questions. Uh, I'm sure we'll be talking about a decent handful of Del Rey titles, so that'll <laughs> connect to Mushishi. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, man, I have one. I have one that I'm still angry about. <laughs> I have several. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have a lot. Well, Delray, I have one. CMX, there's plenty. There's just... Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I've got it's... some CMX, some Tokyo Pop, you know. I just... A lot of... A lot of deeply held grudges... <laughs> <laughs> manga one man they mm, there's sometimes it's sad being a manga collector um sometimes it can be very sad but yep. hopefully we can talk about some series that um maybe have been forgotten in the the interim years because of their their discontinued status and maybe uh, give a spotlight to things that do deserve maybe a sec second chance. So thank you everyone for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, look after yourselves, stay kind, stay healthy, and I will see you in the next episode along with Ray. And so goodbye for now. Bye everyone.